What's up, model makers? I hope you are all doing well and having lots of fun at your workbenches. I know I have been lately. Um, if you've been following my shenanigans, you know that I have taken on a gig as doing uh, uh, as a uh, guest, at least for now, anyway, <laughs> uh, reviewer for Kitmaker Network, and that I have started on the project of doing a construction review of this wonderful kit, which is the Dragon BF109E4 in 132nd scale. And um, just in case you missed the first episode where I did the unboxing, uh, what I mean by an, uh, a construction review is that basically the intent is to just assemble the thing. Uh, glue it up without any paint, any finishing work, uh, whatsoever and just really give you guys as thorough of a report as I can on how it goes together. Um, the engineering, the fit, basically all of those things that uh, you know dictate how it's going to be for you if you decide to purchase and build this kit. So uh, that's, uh, that, that uh, gets into a lot of detail and this segment is going to end up being a total of about an hour long I've already uh, filmed all of the uh, 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 actual footage for assembling the cockpit, which gets us through the first uh, three or four steps on the instruction sheet. And uh, there's quite a lot to show you. So without any further ado on my part, let's have a look. Okay, now I believe I've collected the relevant sprues here that have all of the cockpit parts and uh, what I'm gonna do is just uh, go ahead and uh, with the instructions sitting right here just start clipping parts loose uh, from the sprue because I know that I'm gonna just glue everything up now that's not something that I normally do um, I generally try to strategize the removal of parts from the sprue based on how they're gonna get painted um, if I know that I need to glue parts together before painting, then I, I go ahead and clip them off. But if they need to get painted first, then a lot of times I'll leave them on the sprue, especially if they're tiny little parts, because honestly, there is no better way to hang on to a tiny little part than with the, uh, the uh, uh, sprue gate that you get for free. So, um, that's kind of always my strategy. I also have this weird little quirk that I do where um, I like to clip off chunks of the sprue tree uh, as I go so that uh, I sort of, it sort of helps me stay organized. I know that I'm not going to need this section of it anytime soon and I don't really want that in my way so I'm clipping it off and setting it aside. I also like to clip off chunks of the sprue tree as they get uh, emptied of their parts because that gives me uh, one less place to look when I'm trying to find parts. Again, it's just one of my weird little quirks that helps me stay organized. So as you can see, we've got a lot of little ejector pin pads to remove, which is a little bit of a hassle, but not compared with filling ejector pin marks, that's for sure. And these Zuron uh, sprue clippers make short work of all of them.
Okay, now check this out. Look at parts number 41 and 42. Those are tiny little T-handle, um, you know, switches or uh, valve openers that go on the uh, instrument panel. And those are just beautifully molded little bitty parts. Hopefully we won't lose those before we need them. Now, we've got quite a little collection of parts here. There are lots of pieces for the cockpit assembly on this bird. And um, uh, uh, just when I kept thinking that I should be done clipping parts off the sprue, there was another one that I needed. So I'm ready to go with some assembly. Um, as you can see, I've got a little white towel sitting here. This is something that I use when I'm doing small assemblies like this because one, it makes it easier to see the parts than my filthy uh, work uh, surface. And two, because it's soft and kind of uh, linty, it catches little parts uh, when I inevitably drop them and keeps them from flying off to disappear and or get eaten by the carpet monster that we are all too familiar with. Okay, so before I do this, I just want to say that as I go through this, I don't plan to do any more uh, body work, so to speak, filling, sanding, etc., than is necessary to make sure that the parts go together the way that they're supposed to. So uh, I will make sure, for example, that the uh, remnants of a sprue gate are cleaned off, flush, like that. But if I have to do any additional work to uh, make parts fit together, I'll make note of that because that you know that's something that I think should be part of uh, of a construction review. You know, if there's a fit issue that happens because of something beyond what I consider, you know, just sort of ordinary stuff, then you guys need to know about that. Okay, so uh, we've already gotten into a little bit of adventure with some very tiny parts, including those little T-handles that I showed you before. And uh, this is worth talking about because this already gets into something that uh, is a major difference to Tamiya. And you'll have to forgive me for continually making Tamiya references, but you know I, I feel like that those guys are the engineering standard. Take a look at those two little levers right there. Now, with Tamiya, I would have been able to dry fit those and they would have gone into the exact position and orientation that they were supposed to be in uh, before I ever touched glue to it. But they don't give you the tab and slot features on this part, uh, on, the, on these parts that allow you to do that. So, you, you know, you've got a little bit of guesswork. I don't know the exact orientation of that long lever on the right hand side there so I just kind of have to make my best guess and uh, you know it was a little bit of a challenge to get it stuck there and it, it's going to be very fragile uh, so I'm probably going to reinforce it with a little super glue just to make sure that I don't uh, knock it off. Now I will say that the uh, little knobs, the T-handles, I was pleased with them because uh, you know they they went right into the to the mating holes that they were supposed to go in. Uh, they were even a little bit loose, in fact. But there's nothing more annoying than having a tiny little part that requires work before it uh, will assemble. 
So I'll take a little bit of a sloppy fit any day over one that requires me to drill out a hole or uh, even worse, try and make a pin into a smaller pin. So, uh, you know, a little bit of a uh, little bit of adventure to start off with with the first five parts there, uh, but nothing that I would call a disaster by any means. Okay, something else to notice uh, just on this little part right here. Two halves go together, should be totally bulletproof, but I noticed as I, was, as I was assembling it that the tolerance was actually loose enough that it was possible to misalign these two parts, not badly, but certainly enough to leave you with a, a seam line that if you, you know, wanted to, to make that, uh, you know, smooth, you would have to deal with, so... Just uh, something to, to pay attention to. Okay, so first disaster. And this is what I mean when I say that working on a Tamiya kit is part of an engineered system. I just put this foot pedal on upside down. And the simple fact is that I did it that way because I could. I, I wasn't sure in looking at the instructions exactly which direction it was supposed to go. Um, and it wasn't until I looked at a, at, a, at a subsequent illustration that I realized I'd done it wrong. Let me show you what I mean. You can see right here it's pretty difficult to see what the correct orientation is from that picture. And the fact is that not only does the uh, uh, engineering not make it very easy to mate that part to the tip of that piece that it goes on, but it makes it possible to put it on upside down and on the wrong side even. So. Clearly, that's something that, uh, you know, sets this apart uh, from things that I've done in the past and uh, gives me a little bit of an idea of what I'm going to be up against as I go forward. Okay, time for me to take a little break. As you can see, I've been working on this uh, for about an hour and a half now. And maybe not quite that long. And I've accomplished a lot of sprue clipping and only a little bit of assembly work. Uh, the assembly work has been a little bit slow going. And again, that's because of, you know, things not just uh, sliding together. Um, you know exactly as they're supposed to be and me having to fiddle a little bit to make sure that things are in the correct position. Okay so you can see that I've done some work off camera and made some progress which I really had to do because uh, things were just moving too slowly to capture everything on video uh, even when I speed it up to 500%. Um, so you can see that my strategy has been to uh, kind of build things up in sub-assemblies, which kind of goes along with, uh, I mean, pretty much goes along with what the instructions call for. I am sticking to them as closely as possible. That is really, that's really proven to be uh, absolutely necessary, however, for one simple reason. This plastic is uh, clearly a bit softer than Tamiya plastic. And... That's nice because it cuts and sands uh, real easily. Um, but what I've found is that uh, Tamiya Extra Thin, which uh, I've been using a lot of, um, 
turns it mushy pretty quickly and it takes a lot longer for it to cure up than it does with Tamiya plastic. And so what that means is that um, half an hour or an hour after assembly, you may find that uh, parts will still move around on you. And uh, I definitely discovered that to be true, uh, like on these uh, foot pedals. Uh, so I gave them plenty of time to cure up and then I added a little bit of super glue to the back side of them just to make sure that they were, uh, you know, weren't ever gonna move around on me. Okay, speaking of this uh, particular sub-assembly right here, um, I definitely need to point out one thing. Okay, it's gonna be a little bit difficult to see and I'll have to show you on the instruction sheet as well, but if you look right in here, there's a small rail that goes underneath this. There's actually two pieces right here. This piece and then a piece underneath. And then, um, hang on a second. And then the same thing on this side. This lever right here is part of the same sub-assembly of three pieces that involves this over here and uh, this cross member. And then this right here is a separate piece. Now, you may be able to see that this little piece here is supposed to go underneath this plate right here. And that is in fact the case on both sides. Both of those little spars have to go underneath the plate that uh, you can see the, uh, the joystick is, uh, is mounted to. Now, obviously, if you do what I did and you put the base plate of the joystick onto the floor section first, you will have difficulty getting those other two little spars underneath it. And uh, this is the section of the instruction sheet that specifically we're talking about here. Okay, you can see these parts, F20 and F8 are supposed to go underneath this sub-assembly of F26 and the joystick. And really they need to go underneath this little sub-assembly of these three parts as well. But they don't tell you that anywhere on this instruction sheet. They don't give you an order of assembly. So I was just cruising along and um, I put the base plate of the joystick in and then I started putting this sub-assembly together. And this is another kind of a, of a little tidbit. If you put this whole thing together of these three parts and allow it to cure up before you assemble it to the, to the floorboard, you may have a problem because these two pieces are not gonna be perfectly lined up. So what I did is I put two of them together, let it cure up for a few minutes until it was loosely stuck together, then added those two together to the floor assembly, then brought the third piece in uh, separately, and then that way everything all lined up. But as I said, I did all of that before I added parts F20 and F8. And uh, I was able to get F20 and F8 installed with a little bit of finagling and a little bit of drama. Um, I solved the, the uh, problem of them not going underneath part number F26 by just clipping off the front portion, uh, you know, and again, because it would be underneath, you'd never know the difference. So all's well that ends well. Just, um, you know, one of those things where, um, uh, you know, had the instructions provided a, uh, a little bit more clarity on the order of assembly, uh, you know, I would have avoided that little bit of uh, headache. So uh, what's next is I'm going to carry on with uh, putting these things, putting all these parts together. Um, I'm going to add the seat belts, the brass photo etch parts, to the seat uh, before I add it to the uh, rest of the cockpit sub-assembly. And uh, hopefully those will turn out good. Uh, we'll see. I may have to anneal those brass parts to get them to form the way that I want them to, um, but uh, time will tell. Another thing that I noticed, this is the underside of the fuselage, 
and uh, you're going to add this entire cockpit subassembly to it. But before you do that, they want you to put one of these little scoops uh, in this recess right here. Now, it's an option between the two different ones, which quite frankly look almost identical, and they don't tell you why you would choose one over the other, only that it is in fact an option. So, not really sure what's up with that. I'm probably going to end up just flipping a coin. Okay, so I've made a little bit more progress and ran into another little bit of a challenge. Right here you can see these two ribs, one on the left and one on the right, and there's a notch that they go into on the floorboard here. But there's really nothing that positions them other than that. Now I knew that those were going to have to mate flush against the side of the fuselage, so what I've done is I glued the bottom end of the rib and while it was still movable, I dry fitted the right hand side of the fuselage and then just pushed that rib up against the, uh, the inner wall of it and secured it with a piece of tape just to make sure it stayed flush so that when I come back and reassemble it, that rib will be properly positioned. You should be able to see it in there right there. So when I pull this apart, this has been curing for several hours, so that rib should be secure, and this is a pretty tight fit. Starting to come off. There it goes. Okay, so now you can see that that rib is now perfectly positioned and solid. So I will repeat that process on the other side uh, once I get uh, once I get to that point. Speaking of the other side, I've got that right here and I have uh, assembled the uh, various components to that portion of the fuselage and there's something to talk about that something to talk about here as well. Okay, now, this mechanism right here is four pieces, these two wheels and these two separate chains. And in the instructions, they want you to assemble all four of those together as a sub-assembly and then install to the sidewall of the cockpit. That's never going to work because you're not going to be able to properly align the two chain the two chain pieces so that they mate with the uh, the holes and the pins on the sides of the fuselage uh, so what I so I strongly recommend you not try to do it the way that they show in the instructions but that instead you start with this piece here secure it to the side of the fuselage uh, then you come in with this inner wheel then you come in with the second chain piece, then finally with the outside wheel, and you basically just stack all those up uh, on top of the of the fuselage wall. Worked great, uh, pretty much no problems, um, and uh, actually I think it looks really cool. The detail on those chains is just fantastic. And the only other pieces that you have to add into the fuselage on the left side are this piece and this little lever right here. Okay, one last little bit of adventure to report on before I call it a day. If you look right here, 
you'll see uh, what looks like some sort of a, of a uh, little electrical box. And I say it's electrical because it appears to have some whoops, some uh, wires coming out of the bottom of it. Okay, there's a better view of it right there. Now the instructions act like there are some tabs on the back of it that should mate with some slots on the side of the fuselage wall, but the tabs are not there. There's essentially nothing to tell you where to position this thing other than that you know it can't go across the edge of this groove right here because that's where the uh, uh, that's where this rib right here has to fit. So you don't really know how far up or down to position it, but what you also can kind of see is that right here there's a little notch on the edge of the floorboard. And what that is is it's supposed to make it look like those wires are disappearing down into the floorboard. So what I ended up doing again was gluing it on there kind of uh, you know while it went while it was still soft dry fitting this side of the fuselage onto uh, the uh, uh, floorboard assembly and checking the location of this piece to make sure that it was at the right the right height. What I ended up figuring out was that what you want to do is if you look if you just position it such that the uh, bottom end of the cables is right ab above the top of this boss right here, that's about the right height. And when I, when I test fitted it, it looks uh, perfectly as if those cables are disappearing into the floorboard right there at the at the uh, at the tip of them so hopefully you can you can you can see you can see that and you can and you can also see from looking at this at, at it from this direction that right here where this peg sticks out you've got how much distance you've got from the top of it to the level of the floorboard there and that that's about where the ends of those cables need to be positioned. Okay, so you can see that I've made quite a bit of progress on the cockpit assembly. Um, enough progress that it's uh, basically done at this point. But there are a couple of pieces of uh, drama to report. <laughs> One relatively minor, the other uh, not so minor. Okay, so let me explain. All right, the first one involves this piece right here, okay? You can't see it very well, but it's basically just a thin piece that runs from here to here. And uh, I will show you in the instructions where that's referenced. And uh, you'll, you'll see that there's not much there either. Okay, right here, part number F44 and we are left to assume that the fact that F43 is in parentheses is some sort of code for something. I assumed that it meant, you know, one on the left, one on the right, because there were, in fact, two of the parts, and they looked, as far as I could tell, uh, pretty much identical. But, as you can see from those instructions, there's uh, not a lot of... Uh, of definition on exactly how they go in. And when I looked at the parts, there wasn't any, you know, anything about their design that gave me uh, any better clue. You can see on the opposite side, same thing. So the first time I put it in, I, I put one in, I put this one in on this side, and I put this all the way back up against the edge uh, of the floorboard right here. It, you know, Nothing I did really seemed like a natural fit, and that was about as close as I as I could come. So um, I thought that was okay, and I glued it in. But then when I put the uh, the uh, right hand side of the fuselage on, it wouldn't go all the way on, and I could easily see that there was an interference there. 
And that was also when I started to understand what these parts were actually for. I believe that they are really nothing more than a filler. Um, I don't know why the floorboard was cut with this notch in it right here, but if this piece isn't here, and you're looking at exactly the right angle from the top, you could essentially see light coming up through the landing gear, uh, landing gear housing right here, the, 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 the wheel well, which obviously is not good. Um, and part of how I figured this out was that when you look at uh, this part from the end right here, you may be able to kind of see that this sidewall of it is uh, angled. And that angle basically matches the angle of the fuselage part right here. And so that's how I sort of came to the conclusion that it's really nothing more than a filler. You might be able to get away with without uh, in installing it, but I decided to remove it since it wasn't working the way I had it and uh, figure out a different way. And so what I did is, uh, if you look at this uh, fuselage part, well, I'll show you the other one. Um, you can see that right here uh, on this boss that plugs into the to the side of the cockpit uh, subassembly, that there's a rib up there at the top of it. Now that's what was hitting on the edge of this part before I moved it. So what you can see is that I've moved it so that that notch there basically provides the clearance for that rib. And I think that that's probably how it's intended to go. But again, the instructions don't give you any clue to that. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it is what it is. Hopefully it all, all works out good. I've dry fitted the fuselage and it goes all the way on now. So um, obviously uh, that is at least one solution. Now, that was the minor drama. The major drama, and this is embarrassing, this is probably gonna spell the <laughs> end of my very brief career as a reviewer for the Kitmaker Network. Uh, you'll notice that the guns are just dry fitted on here. They're, you know, they're loose. And I'll go ahead and pop those back off so that you can, or at least one of them, so that you can see what's going on here. These are the ammunition feed trays. And you can see that they're pretty solid little chunks of plastic. And that this one points this direction and the other one points the other direction. Well, when I installed them, I put them on the opposite way. This one was pointing over here and this one was pointing over here. And I didn't realize that was wrong until I went to install the guns. And I was like, how the heck are these guns supposed to fit in here? Because there was absolutely no way that that was going to happen. And when I looked then, I, I, looked, I took another look at the instructions and realized that I had, in fact, transposed these, uh, these parts. And um, that's 100% on me. I, I screwed up. But I want to make the point that the kit made it possible for me to do that. Um, these parts could go on either way, and uh, it didn't immediately look wrong to me, and I went on about my business. And, you know, I don't want to sound like a whiner, but look, good mechanical design dictates that parts in an assembly cannot be put on in multiple ways. Um, in all of the Tamiya kits that I've built, I've found exactly one part that you could completely install and it would be on backwards. And uh, that was a little bit of a disaster, but that's another story. I mean, look, I have rebuilt tons of motorcycle engines in, in my time, and I can tell you that in all of the parts of a motorcycle engine, none of them will go on backwards. I mean, that's just a basic, uh, a basic thing with, with mechanical design. So, um, yeah, I screwed up. Yeah, I wasn't paying attention, and that's on me. But the fact that these parts could go on 180 degrees, uh, you know, apart and still look right uh, and not have any problem assembling it 
is a little bit of an issue with the design and the engineering of the kit. Here's what I would recommend that you do because even when they go on there correctly, the fitment of all this stuff is tough to get exactly right. So what I would recommend you do is that you put these side rail, these mounting rails on and before they're completely set up, go ahead and at least temporarily attach the guns. You probably want to paint the guns separately and you want and so you want to put them on later. And and I totally agree with that. That's how I would do it. But what I would recommend doing is temporarily installing the guns, then take these feed trays, uh, feed chutes and you may have to cut the tab off of the bottom because um, they may not line up perfectly with the receiver on the gun itself if you install it with the tab. There may be a, a gap there that wouldn't look right. So what I would, I would recommend you do is you cut the tab off the bottoms of these two parts and with the guns in place, go ahead and, and, and put those down with some uh, extra thin cement and you'll be able to slide them up against the side of the receiver on, on the gun itself. And then it'll be positioned correctly. You can pull the gun out of there, let everything cure up, and you're in business. No problem. Okay, so enough of the drama. You can see that uh, uh, everything else is looking pretty good. Um, the uh, the seat belts. I had talked about those. I was thinking that that brass was a little stiffer than Edward brass and that I might have to anneal it. It was no problem. I didn't have to do anything to it. Uh, I really like the way that these seat belts formed up and uh, I think I was able to get a, a kind of a natural drape to them and they have them look like they're kind of in disarray and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with that. They, uh, you know, they were, they were one of the least uh, you know, one of the one of the least painful sets of seat belts that I've ever um, installed. I did end up repositioning this lever over here. Uh, I had it sticking straight out, and I looked at a couple of pictures online of ME 109 BF 109 cockpits, and it is much more at an angle like this, kind of facing the floor. So, no big deal. I clipped it off and repositioned it. Okay, I also have uh, got all of the, uh, uh, bo both sides of the fuselage glued up. I, I showed you this side of the fuselage before. The opposite side of the fuselage is also done. Um, and I think I talked about that uh, and the fact that you've got to be careful with positioning this electrical box. Otherwise, everything over here was pretty straightforward. I just realized that I forgot to talk about something that I thought was worth mentioning. Uh, and that is, how did I get these solid little chunks of plastic out of here after they had been thoroughly glued down with Tamiya Extra Thin and, you know, cured uh, for basically 24 hours? Uh, because they were solid. They were basically, you know, at one with this base plate right here. And the trick is, to just use some more Tamiya Extra Thin. Uh, I basically flooded the area all around the parts, flipped it over, uh, dumped some on the uh, place where the tab pokes through the slot, and uh, you know let that sit there for a, a couple of minutes. And then just very carefully, I uh, inserted uh, a tool underneath here. There's a notch under there. And I just started very gently prying on it while holding it down, you know, with my finger and just working it. And, you know, once the cement had done enough of its work to remelt all of this area around here, they uh, pretty much popped right off without too much complaint. Now, obviously, that whole business has left me with a very ugly situation here you know, of goopy melted plastic and, and some other problems there. So, um, you know, if I were going to paint all this up, uh, I'd obviously have to deal with that, uh, you know, and, and clean all that up. With the guns installed, uh, you know, it doesn't show too badly. Uh, so, anyway, that is how uh, I got myself out of that particular bit of drama. All right, so there you go. Here is where we are at at this point with this little uh, ME109 project. And I have to say, overall, it's going, it's going pretty well so far. 
Uh, I'm, you know, extremely impressed with the uh, with the quality of the parts, with the detail. It's the details fantastic. Um, overall, I, you know, I like the way that the build is is going together. It's definitely different from some some things that I'm used to. I know I say it over and over again, but I use Tamiya as the benchmark for fit and engineering. Um, they've earned that spot, and that's all there is to it. So, I hope that doesn't offend anybody that. I, I, I do that, but I feel like it's important to give you guys a frame of reference and some comparison of, of you know, what this is, is like. Um, you know, I, I, I have to say that with nearly 70 pieces, including the photo etch, that this cockpit assembly really is a pretty impressive uh, bit of model kit engineering because Look, that's a lot of stuff that has to fit together and fit together reasonably well. Would I have done some things differently? Yeah, I, I would have. Um, but they didn't do anything here that prevents you from getting a good result. Um, I did not have to make any adjustments to anything in order to get stuff to go together. Um, by that I mean, you know, I didn't have to open up any holes. Um, I didn't have to... Uh, do any cutting or filing or sanding or anything like that to uh, get the parts to go together. I did have a little bit of drama, as you saw, with a couple of parts that um, you know were difficult to know how to position correctly. Um, but uh, again, that that was relatively straightforward to to uh, to resolve. So, how would I rate this kit so far? Um, I told somebody the other day that I would rate this kit as difficult. Now, let me explain exactly what I mean. Um, it's not difficult uh, in the way, for example, that the Revell Germany uh, Piper 132nd uh, Super Cub is. That kit is difficult because literally almost every single part in there is wrong in some way. And, I, and, it, and, it, and it fought me uh, every step of the way. I had to make a lot of adjustments in order to get that thing built. There are a number of things that could have been molded as separate details that were not, so that makes the painting difficult. Um, that, that is one brand of difficult. Another brand of difficult um, that's much less offensive is just having lots and lots of parts and having a complex assembly. Um, but yet everything you know goes together exactly the way it's supposed to and that's the end of the spectrum that i would put a tamiya 132nd kit on um, this thing is somewhere in between again i didn't have to fight with anything really to to get it to go together but because there are a number of places in the assembly of this cockpit section where you can put together you can put it together incorrectly and not figure it out until it's uh, you know almost too late. As you saw, um, there are also a number of situations where you don't uh, you know the the pieces are not guided in such a way that the orientation is automatic, and you have to use a little bit of ingenuity and take some extra steps to make sure that once the glue is cured, that those parts are in fact uh, going to be in the right place. So. Um, you know, it's not mindless. I mean, look, a lot of people say that a Tamiya kit is basically shake and bake um, and that you can put it together without a lot of thought. And there's some truth to that. There's no doubt about that. They've done a lot of the thinking for you before they ever uh, pack the boxes. This kit, so far anyway, requires a lot of thought and you definitely have to pay attention to what's going on in the, uh, in the instruction sheet uh, because you can definitely get off the rails uh, if you don't. But uh, overall, I do think that it's, uh, it's really a fantastic kit so far. So with that said, I am going to set this aside for a bit and work on a few of my other projects. And then in a week or two, I'll get back to this. And we will move on to the next stage, which is the assembly of the engine. Now, between now and then, um, one thing I'm going to do, okay, i got to tell you guys a secret. But you have to promise not to tell Jim this part right here. This is the piece that's got the instrument panel and 
the gun tray and all that stuff in it, it's not really permanently glued in. It's stuck on there temporarily with some masking fluid. Because, yes, I've given in. I am going to paint the cockpit. I, I just can't do it. Uh, it's too cool. Uh, but I, I have three reasons, really, that I'm going to paint the cockpit. Um, one is, the most fundamental one, is um, that it's all assembled. And I've done what I set out to do, which was evaluate the fit and the engineering of all of those pieces. And so painting it now is not going to have any effect on that. The second reason is that I have concocted a scheme, uh, a, ma a master plan, for how I can use this kit later on. And uh, if that pans out, um, it's going to depend obviously on the cockpit being painted. And if I got to that point and I didn't have a painted cockpit, I'd be sorry because I would have a beautiful little ME uh, BF109 uh, sitting here that was, uh, you know, essentially wasted. The third reason is because um, I kind of want to see what I can do. Uh, assembling a cockpit this way is different from what I normally do. Uh, obviously, you can disconnect every single part from the sprue, uh, or you can leave every part on the sprue and paint them all separately and then glue everything up. And, you know, that gives you, uh, obviously, a great result, but it means super glue and, and other things, and it makes the assembly a little bit more complicated. The opposite end of the spectrum is assembling 100% of everything using solvent cement and then painting it all after the fact, which is much more normal for you armor guys. Um, I tend to rest somewhere in the middle of that uh, because I assemble as much as I can, obviously. But if something's got to be separate, like those little guns, um, you know, for effective painting, then I'm, I'm going to do that. But this is a situation where I've got it 100% assembled and I'm going to have to try and paint it and see how well I do. So I think that's uh, sort of a great little exercise and I'm looking forward to it. So... All right, if you guys are still watching and you have followed along with all of this, um, I really appreciate it. I hope that this is uh, interesting for you and that this is an effective way uh, to get a good look at a fantastic kit. And I'll see you next time. As always, much love.